Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you to our program this evening. Uh, before we get started, I just want to offer a special welcome to anyone who may be joining uh, an MHS program for the first time. Uh, if you're not familiar with MHS, we are the uh, first historical society in America, founded in 1791. For the past 230 years, uh, we have been a resource for the public. Today, we maintain a research library, have galleries open to the public, and host a wide variety of programs uh, for both uh, academic and general audiences. This is just a sample of the programs that we host. Uh, we're only able to produce uh, programs like this because of the support of our members. We hope that you'll join future events, and if you enjoy our programs, we hope you'll consider becoming a member or supporting MHS. This evening, we'll be hearing from Professor Gerald Duquette uh, and Professor Aaron O'Brien. Uh, they'll be discussing their new book, uh, The Politics of Massachusetts Exceptionalism, which explores the outsized impact uh, politics from the, the Bay State had exerted on the national stage. The book is a series of essays from a variety of authors who delve into uh, the question of if Massachusetts is truly exceptional, and if so, if it is exceptional uh, because of the virtue of the Commonwealth or despite the vast inequalities in the state. Uh, Gerald Duquette, uh, is an associate professor of political science at Central Connecticut State University. He has published on campaign finance reform, political parties, Massachusetts politics, and political culture and public opinion, and political socialization. He earned his MA and PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, uh, an MPA from the Graduate School of uh, Business and Public Management at the George Washington University, and his bachelor's uh, in politics from the Catholic University of America. Uh, Aaron O'Brien is an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Her primary research interests are uh, the politics of poverty and public policy, voting access in the United States, uh, gender and political participation, and Massachusetts politics. She earned her PhD and MA in political science from American University uh, and a BA in sociology from John Carroll University. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you very much for having us. Um, let me first thank uh, the folks tuning in and the, the hardy few who have turned out here, and we really appreciate that. Uh, and so let me just start off by trying to spend just a few minutes giving you a brief sense of the origins of this volume um, and, and, our, and our basic purpose. Um, the, the book title uh, mentions Massachusetts exceptionalism because it is the organizational concept of the book. It's not really a book that is about debating the notion of American exceptionalism or exceptionalism, but it is a device that allows us to tie together key elements, key explanatory essays that are intended to provide a, a comprehensive portrait of Massachusetts government and politics for both uh, for a general audience, but also for, for a, a sort of a, a scholarly audience as well. Um, so that's sort of the purpose. Now, the origin is somewhat personal. Um, the the this really grew from the MassPoliticsProf.org blog. This is a blog started in 2011 by myself, uh, Peter Ugertasio of Stonehill College, and Mo, uh, Mo Cunningham of UMass Boston. We uh, felt at the time that uh, there was a need in the uh, sort of burgeoning data journalism, internet journalism, there was a need for a, a, a site that would provide a, a political scientist's perspective on Massachusetts politics that wasn't really available. The, the general literature on state and local politics at the time, and even today to some degree, uh, had a lot to say about Massachusetts politics, but a lot of it was wrong. Uh, and, it, and it was wrong not because of any necessarily methodological problem uh, academically, but because it, the context was wrong, because the, the, they were, there was lots of scholarly assumptions that fit the other 49 states or fit most of the, but it didn't fit Massachusetts. And so we endeavored to create a space for folks who study Massachusetts politics, who are much more familiar with Massachusetts politics, who study it in Massachusetts, or I live in Massachusetts, I, I work across the border in Connecticut. Uh, and the idea, of course, was for us to bring our sort of personal experience and knowledge and scholarship of the state to analysis of the state, which, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense because we are constantly as as our state politics is constantly featured uh, in discussions of national politics and so that's where we saw this niche for this 
website. Now we have since more than doubled, uh, bringing on wonderful scholars, including uh, the woman to my left. Erin O'Brien has been with us now for uh, seven, eight, yes. a long I time. Younger. Uh, we are now seven uh, <laughs> Massachusetts. We are now seven mass politics profs. Uh, and this book really uh, uh, is very much what we hope to achieve in terms of the, the website, in terms of the, the blog. Uh, it is, um, as I indicated before, it is an attempt to make sure that it's really written for people in Massachusetts, to be frank. I hope that the press doesn't mind me narrowing our <laughs> market. But the idea is to help people in Massachusetts have, the, have a, a, a real contextually, both historically, uh, institutionally, culturally, uh, uh, um, perspective on the day-to-day -day governing of the Commonwealth. It is, I will say this, in the, in the past decade that we have been endeavored in this, uh, political journalism uh, in and about Massachusetts politics has gotten great. There is a there is very, very exceptional journalism uh, about state government and politics in Massachusetts now, thanks to public television, GBH, GBY, Commonwealth Magazine, WBUR. I mean, there's really a host of media now uh, that I think uh, also we're uh, moving towards the data journalism model, the greatest thing that I ever saw was the hyperlink for as far as I'm concerned, because when you read <laughs> these articles, you're not stuck with just the, you can hyperlink. For those of you who attend an event like this, I know that is appreciated. Uh, but again, th so the, this arises out of a group of professors who love politics and, and particularly love Massachusetts politics. Exceptionalism provided us with a vehicle that actually is a unique thread in the historical narrative of Massachusetts politics that allowed us to take what might otherwise look like a, a fairly dry uh, selection of topics and really make them uh, string together and create consistent themes. I'm going to turn it over to Erin. She's going to do a better job of explaining <laughs> that, uh, that scheme. True. No, I'm totally kidding. You set me up to get along well. When you write a book together, you know these things. Um, what we're going to do tonight is, as Gerald said, the origin story is we think we have something unique to say as political scientists studying Massachusetts politics. We're not, you know, the literature says, but we're using the literature sometimes without people knowing. We're sneaking it in. Um, and the book is organized, as, Mass uh, as um, Gerald indicated, around Massachusetts exceptionalism. What do we mean by that? A lot of states think they're exceptional. Um, one of my grad students, I didn't force them to buy it, I swear, uh, but one of my grad students was pulled a quote from DeSantis, Governor DeSantis of Florida, talking about Florida exceptionalism, which I dare say looks quite different, right? <laughs> um, and so in this book, we define it um, carefully. It, it is this sense that we, and that we as an air quotes, we do it better here. Um, and that better is directly linked to intellectualism, public policy, and good governance. It's a part of residents' identity, okay? It is objectively true in some places, um, you know, a, a, a fidelity to the framers' institutional arrangements, which Gerald will talk about. We are unique and objectively um, accurate. That is an accurate description that the other, most other states can't um, share with us. It's also normative. Um, Massachusetts is one of the least liked states. Uh, I'm not from here originally. <laughs> um, Why did you uh, have to put that in? Right, well, because, again, facts, I do, right? <laughs> um, and it's in part because we have a sense of ourselves that we are better, we are more virtuous, and given that I'm talking to a group of historians, you know this is embedded in political culture from uh, the very beginning. So in today's politics, this idea of Massachusetts exceptionalism is typically used in two ways. And I'll be honest, this is the way I use it the most, <laughs> okay? And that is to cajole, to say, hey, Massachusetts, we can't be this bad at X, you know, whatever it is, because we're Massachusetts. I work at a, a public institution. We're 37th in um, funding public higher education. So I say, Massachusetts, you don't want to run with the states you're running with. So it can be a place to cajole, right? It also can be used to tell the other states what to do. 
that's where they don't like us as much, okay? But um, that is how we define Massachusetts exceptionalism, and we problematize it throughout. Gerald and I are very good friends, and we, I, we had some barn burners doing this, because the six or seven contributing authors play around with that concept. We see it as accurate in some places. We see it as aspirational in others. We see it as falling far short in others. Um, and Mythological that, even. Right, it, exactly. And so that is the theme of the book. We're not saying this is what Massachusetts is. It's that each of these chapters have insights onto those themes. So the barn burners aren't personal. The barn burners are because we're looking at different aspects of Massachusetts politics. And you want, if you're gonna read a volume, you want a narrative hook, um, something that buys it together. So that's what we've done. So what we wanna to do tonight, Gerald's gonna take, and this oversimplifies, the good news story, right? I'm good cop, I'm good cop, you're bad Right, cop. yeah, I'm bad cop. I'm used to it in many realms of my life, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna take um, the more problematized version of uh, Massachusetts exceptionalism. We're gonna give reference to our colleagues who really did wonderful contributions. Then we're gonna throw out some big themes and then you're gonna um, give us tough questions. <laughs> Very good. Um, so as the good cop, uh, what I wanna try to uh, talk about is the, the uh, elements of Massachusetts politics that um, we can point to um, in a sort of objective way, uh, exceptional as in different, not, not necessarily virtuous or exemplary, but certainly different, even though it might sound like we're giving the state a compliment when we say that the, the institutions of our, um, of, our, of our government and politics have developed in a way that is more faithful to the Madisonian logic of the U.S. Constitution than, in fact, the U.S. Constitution is, but that's really for you to decide, right? Uh, uh, you, some of us might think that that's a compliment and some might not, but it is objectively clear. And so in several of what we call the institutional chapters of the of the book, uh, for instance, we have chapters on state and lo uh, regional, local and regional governance. We have chapters on the general court, the legislature, the governor, and of course the SJC, the constitution and the courts. We have a chapter on political parties and elections. We have a chapter on the, um, on the um, initiative and referendum process. These are sort of the kind of institutional chapters in which you can sort, you get the sense that the, the the trajectory of Massachusetts uh, political development uh, within this exceptionalism infused political culture looks uh, many ways the same, but in many other ways very different than the trajectory of American political development. Uh, in all of these chapters, for example, in the legislative chapter and the governor's chapter, particularly, uh, both myself writing one and uh, Shannon Jenkins of UMass uh, Dartmouth writing the legislative chapter, we both keyed in on the, uh, the, the incredible durability in Massachusetts of legislative supremacy. Now, you may recall your junior high civics when uh, you learned that, you know, the, the Congress was supposed to be sort of uh, the first among equals, that legislative supremacy was a concept uh, that, that was uh, part of the uh, logic of the U.S. Constitution. But the reality, of course, is that uh, the development of the U.S. Constitution, of the U.S. Congress didn't, didn't turn out that way. Well, that, that did turn out that way uh, in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has never wavered from its own constitutional design, which, in, which uh, put in place legislative supremacy. As I su suppose many of you know, given the type of folks who would come to such a, an affair, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 is obviously older than the US Constitution and in fact was the primary model for the US Constitution. So when we Massachusetts politics and constitutional people talk about the Madisonian logic of the Constitution, we might really wanna be saying the Adamsian logic of the Constitution, but the reality is that the US Constitution in, in very profound ways is was modeled on the Massachusetts Constitution. However, the development of national politics and government uh, moved in the direction of executive centered governance. And interestingly enough, a lot of the historical uh, periods in which that took place also were initiated and were uh, happening in Massachusetts, and yet they never did shift to a very gubernatorial centered 
politics. So when we look at the development of the uh, chief executive of the presidency, when we look at the development of the presidency, when we look at the development of the federal bureaucracy, we find precedent for much of it in Massachusetts. The difference being that in Massachusetts, they, the, the system never did shift to an executive centered or a presidential one. And there are some unique uh, reasons for that that are chronicled and discussed and analyzed in the book in several chapters. That's just one sort of example. Uh, even when you consider that one of the most progressive era innovations, the initiative and referenda process, the Massachusetts initiative and referenda process, despite the fact that the rest of the country sees us as the bluest of blue progressive stronghold, is, is unquestionably the most conservative, the least direct, direct democracy uh, ballot uh, process in America. I believe there's 24 states that have this, and uh, Massachusetts has the least direct uh, direct democratic uh, <laughs> process. And that's that speaks to something that is thematic in the book as well. And that is that one of the exceptionally different elements, and again, not normative, positive or negative, you decide, but is the in exceptional resistance in Massachusetts to uh, reform, quite frankly, uh, little d democratic reform. Massachusetts gets lots of credit for being the cradle of democracy in all kinds of ways. What we sort of bring out in this book is that despite all of that, even when that reputation has some merit, uh, throughout it has been a far better resistor of little d democratic reform than anyone outside of the, uh, you know, the, the insider sphere, I, I think non insiders would realize, and that is exceptional. And as we sit here in amidst a unprecedented attack on American democracy on uh, that, that we could all obviously talk about as well. It is particularly useful, we hope, to have a volume that looks at what we consider to be the, the, uh, the state best and most useful for diagnosing national problems because of its parallel development not only its parallel development in the substantive ways that we're all used to thinking about this uh, in terms of American political history, but precisely in the fact that both American and Massachusetts exceptionalism are, are uh, from the same seed bed, right? They are the trunk uh, and the tree branches grow one way. One is Massachusetts, the other US. Obviously, they don't stay together. And obviously, there's something about the development of Massachusetts that didn't lead it in the same direction as the US in profound ways that are detailed in the book and that we can uh, talk about here. But I probably am getting close to what uh, my mandated. Uh, um, but but it's a, my what I really want to make sure I get across in this little segment is that institutional stability uh, we live in a state, despite its progressive reputation, that is enormously establishment friendly. We do not have a left right partisan political debate to speak of inside the state house. It's there. We know we can we can access it, but it has very little resonance inside the state house. We have an establishment friendly. Uh, electoral system. We have we have a very top down legislature. Uh, those of you who are very familiar with Massachusetts politics, we talk about the big three in Massachusetts. There are three people who who really direct government, and that is of course the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president. If I were to put them in order of the power and influence, however, it would be the speaker, and then depending on the other two, you know, one or the other. The Speaker of the Massachusetts House has always been, well, that's, I shouldn't say that, has in modern times always been the most influential uh, person at the State House. And because we have legislative supremacy, because we have always, with a brief transitionary period in the middle of the 20th century when the Republican dominance translate, uh, sort of transferred into Democratic times, we have always had one party dominant government in Massachusetts. And it's because we've had one party dominance that the real debate has always been an intramural one within that dominant party. And there are some really 
negative things that we will hear about that one party dominance, right? And but at the same time, we we have to stop given the situation in America today, and we have to maybe ask a, an obnoxious question. And that is to say, given what is going on in America today, given the frontal assault on democracy that we're living through, uh, is it possible that the one party dominance, recall the framers didn't not intend to have necessarily competitive parties, is the one party dominance, has it become a net positive in some ways, given the uh, uh, existential threat to the larger notion of American democracy that we face today. So that's that's some of where uh, I uh, I want to go, and maybe we'll go further in the Q and A. Now I will hand it over to my bad cop. <laughs> uh, and if those are places that Massachusetts, as Gerald was careful to say, normatively you can decide whether those are good, but they are largely places where Massachusetts is exceptional, and it is rooted in an intellectual tradition. Right, it's exceptional for these reasons of uh, policy and good governance and adherence there. So, where is our uh, high opinion of ourselves unmerited? There's a lot of that in this book too. <laughs> like, if you were feeling good, stop. That's why I'm here. Right. Um, the first, and this is really throughout the book, uh, or it is throughout the book, is the way in which Massachusetts uh, as racism and racial politics. Um, yes, Massachusetts is understood as the bluest of the blue, um, but that label can really uh, undermine or silence uh, the Massachusetts particular um, ineptitude on race. Obviously, uh, anybody who knows about Boston knows about the busing crisis of the 1970s. It is still a part of the public mind. Uh, even though you know many weren't born in the 70s. Uh, Ayanna Presley is the first woman of color elected to Congress. We have uh, individuals of color, one third of the population in Massachusetts. They are 13% of the state legislature. Um, the gaps in voter turnout, we talked about this in chapter eight across racial categories are dramatic in Massachusetts. Now there's a little bit of a question about the data, um, but this, these racial gaps found, it, um, uh, found its way into oral arguments for SCOTUS, undermining the Voting Rights Act, saying Massachusetts is a blue state and these got, they've got these hu huge gaps. Why do we need preclearance here, right? So that's where Massachusetts exceptionalism helped undermine the VRA, the Voting Rights Act. Um, wealth inequality here in Boston, the average black family has $8 of wealth. Um, and the average white family has $247,000. Two people in my family like thought they were helping me out. And they were like, oh, you know, Aaron, we think there's a typo in your book. I'm like, there's not a typo in my book, <laughs> um, our book. <laughs> right. At least not that one. Uh, yeah, but it was my, I wrote it. So mm -hmm. high school dropout rates. Um, we, we, are, um, we do well in not having people drop out, but we are 37 of the 50 states worse in racial gaps and dropping out. Okay, uh, our COVID adjusted death rates in Massachusetts, 139 per um, 100,000 uh, uh, for Asians, uh, 319 for Blacks, 332 for Hispanic, 105 um, for Whites. Uh, Sonia Chang Diaz, who was running for governor, calls this a textbook study of structural racism. So this is very much a part of uh, Massachusetts politics, and it, it's a place where we do not um, uh, adhere to what we believe about ourselves, right? Um, secondly, as uh, Gerald uh, was talking about, this book can't talk about Massachusetts in the modern era without talking about Democratic Party dominance. Now, for many of you in the room, not all, you're like, great, love it, better than the alternative, okay? And that's for you to decide. <laughs> However, it does have unintended consequences, two of which are corruption. Uh, our colleague Shannon Jenkins at UMass Dartmouth talks about um, the state legislature and the amount of corruption um, at that it, uh, without transparency, without competitive parties, we have seen corruption um, and we see it in red states too when they have single party control. But guess what, Massachusetts, these blue Democrats aren't less corrupt and that single party dominance is one of the major reasons why. And some of my own work, as well as my colleague, uh, our colleague Luis Jimenez, uh, in chapters 10 and 11, um, he looks at uh, Latinx politics in Massachusetts, 
I look at women and women of color in Massachusetts. And both, uh, Massachusetts is, well, I'll get into this in a minute, but decidedly average in electing women. When you look at like uh, the plots of state legislatures, the average of the 50 states in terms of electing women, in terms of percentage of the chamber, Massachusetts follows that line exactly. It doesn't do better, right? Why? Competitive party, parties aren't good actors. They're not bad actors. They're self-interested actors. Okay, parties expand, we know this from political science, parties expand um, candidate selection uh, in terms of diversity, and they expand their base when they experience an electoral threat. And in Massachusetts, that hasn't happened. We have a very right set of conditions for electing women in terms of um, low religiosity, uh, high education rates, high um, relative income, but that doesn't translate to electing women in part because the Democratic Party hasn't had to reinvent itself. Tellingly, the cases that we talk about right now, the, you know, Maura Healy or Ayanna Presley ran against the party, right? They were not the party favors, favorites, and we can talk about insiders and outsiders. Same thing with Latinx politics. Um, now, the, he can talk about there's a Latinx is a huge, terrible umbrella term in some ways because there's so much diversity within the group. But nonetheless, Latinx population are not represented in elected office, percentage wise, even close to where they are in the population. So we say, hey, Massachusetts, big, great blue Massachusetts, look at us. But hey, everybody be like this. We're the progressive. We know what we're doing. We're diversity. We're not. OK, and we attribute a lot of that to single party dominance. And that's not to say there might be better policy outcomes in some realms. You know. Probably me, Aaron, not Professor O'Brien hat. Okay. But there are these other unintended consequences that are very real um, when it comes to descriptive and substantive representation. We have got uh, a knowledge economy that's amazing in many ways. Uh, this creative class, the highest percent of college graduates, um, but uh, the high median income doesn't make it up for the fact that we're the fourth most expensive state to live. And we saw with early COVID that uh, a knowledge economy has a lot of um, uh, workers supporting those knowledge workers. And they were eviscerated by COVID, you know, um, your restaurants, your childcare, all those things, okay? Um, but, but, but there's also, this is ironic saying this in Boston, but there's still the, the sense of Massachusetts is really Boston, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I live here, I kind of happen to agree, but I'm wrong, right? Um, so in terms of Massachusetts exceptionalism, people in other areas of the state regularly question that commitment to um, policy outcomes and policy outputs, transportation for everywhere else in the state, that um, the hub remains a real challenge in Massachusetts politics. Uh, uh, and I even do it to Gerald sometime. I'm like, I, he's like, Aaron, you just give me the Boston data, not the Massachusetts <laughs> data. I'm like, fact, okay? Um, and as well as Gerald talked about, um, Shannon talks about the localism in chapter two, and um, Gerald and um, Mo Cunningham talk about the initiative and referendum process and the way in which, yeah, not direct democracy or the, the least direct direct dem democracy <laughs> and even there the ways in which you know um, corporate uh, interest and interest um, moneyed interests, I should say, have been able to even co opt that particular system and they talk in their chapter about how that's a real shift that um, and he can talk about it if he wants, but that that wasn't always the case, but something has changed there so. Have lots of chapters in here, but it gives you a flavor of the way in which we play around with this concept of Massachusetts exceptionalism. And I think it helped us in thinking about the book, like when we were disagreeing about how exceptional Massachusetts is, it's because he was talking about institutions. And, you know, it's always, yes, when that is your focal point, that this Massachusetts exceptionalism, this intellectualism, um, the way these institutions can stick around and be a model to the other 49 states is real. But when you're talking about what everything else I just listed, we look really bad, <laughs> exceptionally poor, if you will. Um, so before we turn it over to you, we will add, I, I will just say that um, one other theme that we haven't talked about that is a defining theme, well, first is single party dominance. That really weaves itself mm -hmm. throughout this book. 
The other, and you hinted at this, is the idea of insiders and outsiders. It's less a story. If you talk, which we did, you know, lots of interviews, talk to a ton of people. If you talk to people in Massachusetts politics, it is less a story of D versus R than insiders or outsiders. Um, and those in insiders are understood as, you know, white men, Irish, Catholic, what neighborhood are you from? What high school did you go to? Mm -hmm. When I moved here, I was like, you haven't heard of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, um, so that's sort of old school, but it's ironic. Those, those insiders say, wait a second, I came up rough. You know, my family oftentimes has an immigrant story. Um, so they have a, uh, they push back against that idea of insiders, but they are themselves gatekeepers. The outsiders, the progressive Massachusetts, the activists um, have really gained more power, but they've gained more power because of a more Healy, of an Ayanna Presley that um, challenged the democratic status quo. You know, Tolman was supposed to win over Healy. You know, when Ayanna Presley uh, decided to run against a fairly popular Democratic congressman, the, the establishment in other years could have squelched both of those. And that hasn't happened. And that has opened up the floodgates. But if you want to understand Massachusetts politics, spend less time on D versus R and spend more time on insider, outsider, and how people understand themselves within that um, binary. So to conclude, before we turn it over to you, uh, we think what our book does exceptionally well. Can I, a, can I just give a quick example sure. of something? Uh, as I read the, the newspaper in the last few weeks, we read about the fact that the state legislature refuses to lower our gas tax, it's despite the Connecticut and others doing. We, we just saw the leadership come out and, and announce a tax relief package of course, they didn't show you the bill because it hasn't been written yet. And hasn't, <laughs> so, so just think about how odd these things Details. are, right? Uh, these are things that are explained by the book, right? That that is textbook Massachusetts politics because the 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 tax there's they don't need. Why didn't they succumb to the pressure of a gas tax holiday? Very simple no competition on election day we, we also may, may have forgot to mention we have the least competitive state legislative elections in america have for many many decades mm -hmm. so they are there is no threat we have we actually have very weak party organizations in the state but we have very strong party in government which is to say the the leadership of the of the um, of the house and senate are nominally democratic leaders but they're they're hardly progressive Right? They're focused on the maintenance of power. They are not unresponsive to all progressive change. Right? They, they're professional politicians. They know when they have to bend. Right? We've seen bending. We've seen police brutality reform. Where we've seen immigrant driver's license. When we saw the eight-term Secretary of State suddenly decide transparency might be something we should take seriously because he has a very effective uh, challenger in uh, Tanisha Sullivan going, coming up against him in this election. So it's not that these professional politicians ignore, you know, the pressure of the, of the activists, but they calculate. They do the cost-benefit. They know when they have to bend. They know what they have to do to avoid breaking, to avoid giving up that power. And so when, so one of the things I hope we, that people who read the book get is, you're gonna be reading the paper a little bit differently, almost as if you're kind of uh, in the know, because I, I think a lot of these stories that we sort of see as, yeah, that's, that's typical. I think we tried to explain why that is and how that is deeply ingrained and embedded in our cultural and institutional development in the state. Indeed, and that's a great example too, but we have a chapter, um, that's one of mine, uh, it sounds really, uh, on voter access that shows how, you know, when Galvin, uh, Secretary Galvin had a challenger and just Zakem, all of a sudden we were amongst back of the pack in terms of voter access. Um, we were, run, again, running with states we don't want to run with, cajole. Right, but that competitive election now, you know, Galvin ended up trouncing him when it, that the election actually happened. All of a sudden, certain things start changing. Oh yes, we can do same day. You don't have it's no excuse early voting. Things like that started to change, and so that's a place where Massachusetts has really improved. Okay, it's not you know all right. this bad news story, but right. for a group of historians, it's not. This is not a, a book that tells you what's going on today, though it does. 
we do get at those uh, historical underpinnings, probably not in the same ways that historians do, but empirically show how these trends developed. And I hope, we hope that um, with our colleagues who are really amazing that uh, a more complicated view of Massachusetts politics and Massachusetts exceptionalism emerges. It's complicated is the subtitle of the conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, we'd love to take um, um, some questions, um, cries of outrage and <laughs> other uh, along there. I kind of was wondering who came up with the idea that Massachusetts is exceptional, mm -hmm. because I certainly never have regarded it as such. And <laughs> I was um, thinking of a case where I was on a phone call with a guy I worked with in New York, and we were talking about some shenanigans in the New York legislature. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, of course, I'm sure you probably don't understand it being from Massachusetts. He had the idea that this is like, you know, Pericles and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> et cetera. And I said, I find well, that hard to believe. Uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the first thing I think about with Massachusetts politics is our uh, distinguished Mayor Curley. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I was um, growing up, it was my dad would always tell you about Mayor Curley yep. and, uh, you know, how many indicted and convicted uh, speakers of the uh, state house do we have, et cetera. An exceptional rascal. So I was going to say, this is like one of the main reasons I came over is I wanted to find out what this was all about because <laughs> I frankly was totally unaware of uh, <laughs> this being an exceptional place in terms of politics in a positive sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, interestingly, we are here in the Massachusetts Historical Society, and uh, I happened upon a piece uh, that was published a couple of years back in the, uh, the, the journal published by the society by, a, uh, by actually an English professor uh, at the University of Washington in St. Louis, and it's a fabulous article, and he basically he indicated that uh, Jeremy Belknap, the founder of this august institution, was a, a, a very devoted, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, advocate of exceptionalism. Now, American exceptionalism, however, the Massachusetts, he didn't call it the American Historical Society, and he wasn't collecting you know, everything. He was very much focused on Massachusetts being the seedbed of American exceptionalism. He was, it, uh, it, it seems fairly clear that this institution kind of had an ironic beginning because he and others like him, we might look at them today and see them as propagandists, and yet they built the foundations of collections and work that have become vital to actual academic historians and objective scholarship about uh, about history. So the origin of Massachusetts exceptionalism might be right where we sit. Uh, uh, there's a very good argument to be made that uh, Obviously, we, we always trace it to the Winthrop sermon, yeah. which, which is you know sort of a, a catch. But the reality is that in the 1790s, there was a very strong sense that we needed to keep this faith. And I mean faith, right? These are all Protestant ministers, after all. We need to keep this faith in America's uh, destiny important. In fact, the article I was referencing is called True History. They had this notion that exceptionalism was God revealed true history. And even though they developed into professional historians collecting material objectively and, and their work spawned real history, that's really where we can go to look for the origin of this idea that if we do it better. Yeah, and very briefly, all I'll say is you're right, we don't measure up. <laughs> like, I, the, the, the curly example or you know we talk about political humor and stuff like that in the book last three speakers but yeah like the, you, you're right we don't measure up but there's still the um propaganda you called it but that that it's still there so that's what i think the book does a good job of saying this is what don't practice what we preach right this is what we're putting out there shut up about this curly stuff shut up about the corruption but we're this so it's myth making if the state's so progressive, why have there been so many Republican governors? An excellent and, and also, I mean, Ed King was a Democrat, but he was no progressive. So how does, is, is it a balance between the people who are willing to elect the legislature, but they want to check on it? Or are they that sophisticated? 
or is something else that, or is it just lousy well, you know, democratic you candidates you wrote the chapter. You well i was laughing when you said that or grinning because he wrote the chapter on the governor and you it's like you were a plant and yeah, set him up for that so you plant. should take this one first. um the um here's the thing the the massachusetts uh, uh state house is run not by the governor uh the governor is number two or three in the pecking order uh, it's run by the speaker, uh, mostly, but also by the Senate president. And so what has happened in the last several decades is that the stakes of the partisan stakes of gubernatorial elections for uh, the state, the folks who run the state house are incredibly low. In fact, I have argued for decades that Democratic leadership on Beacon Hill, frankly, right. is just as happy, maybe even prefers to have uh, Republican governors so that they can deflect uh, pressure from the left mm -hmm. and conduct a more transactional, uh, uh, you know, sort of establishment friendly policy making process yeah. to cover. Uh, what, when I think, and I talk about this in the book, when we think about, um, you know, the, the Democratic uh, governors of late, uh, the Deval Patrick came in with a great deal of progressive fanfare. Well, I don't know about you, but when I heard him, his very two week long run for 2020 president, he was bragging about having been the governor who accomplished pension reform and who was able to bring, you know, sort of warring factions together to make compromise. He didn't sound like someone who had uh, been a progressive governor. And the fact of the matter is that his progressive uh, wings were trimmed considerably when he was the governor by a legislature that is much more interested in incrementalism, is much more interested in maintaining the status quo and making sure that uh, the state's commercial interests are not interested in buying Republicans, right? Why would, you have to understand in Massachusetts, Republicans come with all kinds of really bad for business, social conservative baggage. And so the Chamber of Commerce crowd in our state is much more pleased with a moderate, economically moderate, especially legislature. They don't care if it's run by Democrats. They know that they have a voice in policy making at the state house. They because the Democratic, you know, the Democratic left is a, is really not nearly as influential as most of the rest of the country thinks they are in the state house. When you think about what happens at the state Democratic conventions. Right? State Democratic conventions probably uh, endorse statewide candidates uh, who end up losing the Democratic primaries much or more than they endorse the eventual winner. It's very clear that the, that the party organization for the Democratic and Republican parties is dominated by activism, even some would say extremism, but they do not have a very significant amount of influence in the actual day-to-day -day governance of the state. And I find Gerald's analysis very compelling of the legislature, that, that Democrats, wink nod, don't, it's sort of what's happening to Biden right now, right? When you have the Senate, when you have the House, people expect you to do stuff, right? right? So uh, having a Republican governor is a bit of a cover. Um, from a different perspective, though, like I like you, I, I find it, it's wild. I just looked up, you know, in 2021, in terms of voter enrollment in Massachusetts, um 31.6 percent uh, are enrolled as democrats 9.7 percent are enrolled as republicans and 57.4 percent are unenrolled which is independent here right so there is something odd about an electorate that skewed quite regularly uh electing republicans uh, but i think there's a bit of um an interesting case going on, right? We obviously were Charlie Baker, a socially moderate, you know, um, certainly not a Trump Republican, right? Um, we're electing a certain type of Republican uh, governor, right? That is sort of the model of New England Republicanism of back the day. But uh, as we know from the current race uh, to replace Baker, one of the reasons he didn't run is because the GOP party establishment, not necessarily those 9.7%, has gone Trump. He can't get through his own party. And I am so risk adverse as a person, I will bet everything I own that uh, Maura Healy cleans up against Jeff Deal by multiple points. So I think what's an interesting case there we're willing to elect a certain type of Republican, but not right now a Trump Republican, though 
Um, my personal view is if you're, even though I, me, Aaron, happen to not be, the, the Trump wing isn't what I'm hoping for in Massachusetts. But if you're Jeff Deal and you've lost for so long, why not try to reinvent the party? He's playing the long game here. But no, well, the other thing is uh, the lack of decent candidates on the Democratic side. So uh, Bill Will, well, and I voted for Bill Will. There's no way I was voting for John Silver. <laughs> okay. Walter uh, Coakley must have been the worst candidate in the history of Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> and she barely lost to Charlie Baker. Right. Two points, yeah. So that's that's the other. I hope you've included that in your analysis. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. And you have to understand these these races, Baker uh, and the, and the AG. They uh, Baker was able to win that race because it wasn't about political party; it was about the candidates. Correct. Republicans run the candidate centered races, and the, the the powers that be in the Democratic legislature are perfectly fine with that. So is the Bob Patrick election different? The devout politics, that's a great question. One thing I would, I don't know if I'm disagreeing with you or not, but <laughs> that Charlie Baker didn't run for a third term for the reasons that she states, but there's another, and I would say maybe even more profound reason, because it was a third bite at the apple was a bit, was a, was a bridge too far. Uh, it would have been much, much more difficult for Democratic leaders on Beacon Hill to sit on their hands for a third time, or at least a second time. I, plus he's rich he doesn't need us right COVID the rest but I do like with total love and respect I think the idea that um Martha Coakley was the worst candidate since whatever is myth making um we've had plenty of average candidates that are men that are repeatedly elected and so uh, remember if we go back to that that was you know um uh, the timing there and other things. And so, you know, her resume is great. Yes. Did she not shake hands at Fenway? A hundred percent. Right. But other candidates have made similar blunders. And when she was running, Massachusetts was even worse for electing women. So I think she was an average candidate who paid a disproportionate price um, for some of her mistakes. Keep in mind, she was not the endorsed candidate in the state convention. She was, Steve Grossman was the convention's choice. Well, the point is that Steve Grossman is the guy who the progressives of the party had backed for that. We think of her as a, as a progressive. Well, she had problems with, with Massachusetts progressives. The reason uh, that she was unsuccessful in the Senate election, the special election that sent a Republican, this was a, a huge mm -hmm. anomaly. The reason she, one of the reasons she was unsuccessful is because the left didn't like her. They sat on their hands in that special election, never That's imagining right. she would lose, but not happy with her lack of forward thinking progressivism with aggressive progressivism. So, you know, when you think of Coakley, it's, Obamacare, it's, yeah. it's not really necessarily a candidate problem. She was situated in a very, uh, she was, she was understood and situated in a pretty precarious way. She didn't really have a whole, the wholesale support of the kind of progressives that we normally would associate that, that Maura Healy, I assume will. So, um, everything is relative. I think in this discussion, I moved here 11 years ago from New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I will tell you in terms of corruption and poor constituent service massachusetts has a long way to go to catch up with new jersey <laughs> it um the the taxes are far higher there both property taxes and income taxes and what do you get for that really bad constituent service mm -hmm. the bipartisan agreement in new jersey that the government stinks mm -hmm. so um i you know i i think that yeah, I, I've come here and to me, this is like, wow, this place is really well managed. I'm really mm -hmm. impressed. So it's right. put me in the Massachusetts column. Uh -huh. my, my question is, um, and maybe you've covered it in terms of the incrementalism, some of the other characteristics, but uh, obviously there are adverse consequences from single party dominance. Mm -hmm. But Massachusetts seems to have avoided some of the um, extreme outcomes you get in other states where there's single party dominance. So California, Texas, right. And maybe you could speak to how they've Certainly. managed to avoid that, and, and maybe you've already really covered that. I mean, I think some of it's the professionalization of the literature, or the, the literature of the legislature. But to, to return to your first point, you know, I'm from Ohio originally. I moved around a lot, but I went to high school and stuff in Ohio. And, you know, I paid my property taxes here. My parents paid it there. And where is this Taxachusetts thing? 
right? Like, I'm like, I'm not seeing it, but the property taxes are significantly lower, right? So I think there is, and especially in the post row world, I'm really glad I live here, right? And so this is a book that can acknowledges that. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's very clear in that sort of setting. Now, why has the legislature or why has Massachusetts not gone the way of the total dysfunction of California? That's a really good question. I think some of it is, you know, size of the legislature, size of the state, quite frankly. Um, and some of it is the degree of professionalization. And in California, they do have more I don't know, you know, I'm not an expert in California politics, so I do know enough there. I think both of those are our factors, um, but there is a Republican Party in California um, and, and the margins have been tighter. The, the margins are certainly a heck of a lot tighter and, and in California than they are here. What are we, 36 and four in the Senate? So I think all those factors play in, but I do think the size of the state makes a difference. I agree with all of that, but I would add that the difference between these states and, and Massachusetts is the single party dominance doesn't mean we don't have a cleavage, we don't have to pay it, it's just intramural. And it, but it's not left right ideological. All of those states have fundamentally left right ideological, very much, you know, some worse, some better than the national dialogue. We just don't have it. Right. Uh, I'm from West. I'm the Western mass politics prop, as I like to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Springfield. Well, out in Springfield, you don't it, whether you're a Democrat or Republican isn't terribly important. We have Republican House members and, and they get, you know, favors from the chair, uh, from the from the speaker as well. Why? Because even though some of they make sort of noises to attract the conservative crowd, they play ball. Right? They understand the transactional nature. And of they're invited job. to the game. And they're invited to the game. Right? I, um, uh, I don't, it's not an anecdote from the book, but I, uh, I have a vivid recollection of shepherding a, a young candidate for a Kirk Clark reports uh, post a couple of decades or two ago <laughs> and to, to, uh, to, uh, to someone understood to be sort of the, uh, a, a, a major influencer in the Democratic Party and of Western Massachusetts. And, uh, and, I, and that person is someone I respect a great deal who, who told me uh, that, you know, he's a nice kid, Gerald, but uh, I'm with Brian Lees. Brian Lees, of course, was a Republican state senator at the time who was then retired from the Senate and decided to pat his, his pension and become a clerk of courts. Oops, I hope he doesn't see this. <laughs> um, uh, and so this person I'm speaking with said, you know, we're with Brian all the way. We don't care what party is. This, isn't, this has nothing to do with that. So your guy is, is not, I can't be with your guy. So in other words, there, the, the, when we think of democratic politics and party politics, I think we're all conditioned to think of it ideologically. And that just isn't the way it works in Massachusetts. But it's a great research question. Uh, we have a question online from Brett who asks, how have people relocating here for tech or academic purposes affected both traditional and social exceptionalism? And in fact, have they? Can you say it one more time? How, how people moving here for education right. have, have impacted this notion of exceptionalism. Uh, well, I mean, right up we give the figures in, in the book. I don't remember them offhand. I'm looking at you like you asked the question. <laughs> um, but uh, we give the figures in the book. If you just, the number of um, politicians that have passed through Massachusetts, right? National big name right. politicians just because of, you know, what's across the river. Um, so there's a, that's one place of major national influence. Uh, uh, most people who come here to study leave, right? right. Um, and so that is a place where, expo I mean, look, Barack Obama, right? You know, or yeah, yeah. Um, and it comes to study and then leave. So that's a way in which an experience in Massachusetts does spread out. Now, some of them deny it, like they were never here, right? You know, like Harvard, what's Harvard? You're like, <laughs> We saw your picture, you were on law review. But that is one real place. The second place I would say speaks to one of these tensions. Um, and oftentimes, I don't like the term, but it's sort of like the townies versus the new people, right? But I think um, this activist core that has been more successful at challenging the Massachusetts Democratic Party is drawn from a lot of young people, a lot of local young people. I'm in, you know, UMass Boston. Those kids, primarily students, are local. But there are also a lot of energies from the colleges and universities 
in the town. So there are uh, the proverbial outsiders because you know they're college students, they're very progressive, and the view of many in town is that they're not going to stick around. For a long time, the Democratic Party just didn't pay attention to those people, right? Because they, they're they're outsiders, they're interlopers. But that activist core that was, and, you know, why did Kennedy lose uh, against Markey? I mean, Ed Markey, sorry, he's not the progressive savior <laughs> of all things ever. You know, they're not that different on policy, but those activists decided he was, and that's what mattered. And a lot of those people, not all those activists, are drawn from people who come to Massachusetts for a bit, get excited, and eventually leave and go elsewhere. But, you know, I mean, so political socialization shows us 18 to 25 is one of the is the most ripe time for political socialization and one of the few times you're willing to change your mind right. we get those people who become leaders for a long time so those are two places anymore. yes those are two places where the um the interlopers uh are uh quite influential but they do run against their time in massachusetts sometimes too i was i was just gonna ask you to elaborate a little more on the um the Italian uh, Irish thing. Um, I've been recently spending a lot of time in New Hampshire, which I wasn't familiar with. And uh, uh, I feel like the whole vibe in New Hampshire is totally dominated <laughs> by this weird French Canadian mm -hmm. kind of outlaw thing. Uh -huh. And and I just somehow feel there's some comfort, even though we have the kind of insider outsider thing and the corruption and all that, which I guess isn't as bad as it is in New Jersey, <laughs> but there's some comfort in the sense that, you know, um, yeah, I know we're, uh, you know, kind of, you know, doing some stuff behind your back, but we have your back. Whereas in New Hampshire, I get the sense of, you know, get out of my way, you know, it's the whole live free or die. And so can you relate that also to this notion, you know, that famous uh, book? Fisher? Fisher. Yeah, David Hackett Fisher. There's a book called Albion Seed, and he analyzes the whole structure of the United States into strains, and one of them is the New England town meeting strain. Do you know what I mean? So, sure. so I guess my question is, is like, to me, there's a comfort in kind of the, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. whereas as we sort of go outside this now, I, I'm really afraid to go other places. <laughs> I mean, I, I really am, but I just somehow feel that there's this kind of thing here sure. where we're going to take care of you, uh, and it sort of spreads to the identity, really, with professional sports, too. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? So, I mean, do you have any notion about that? Sure. I'll, uh, I was thinking of Noel Ignatiev, um, right, how the Irish became white. Um, I... I'm not a historian, but what I will say is my sense of that influence of, you know, the, the way uh, uh, Massachusetts has understood the sports teams, you know, and the racism, all of it, um, of Irish and Italian, you know, fighting out. Of, there's a long history, right, a political history here in Massachusetts of those groups fighting it out. You know, it was a big deal when Menino won because he's Italian, um, but there is a certain like, I'll fight you like hell, but you're still family. Right when someone starts saying bad things about you, I can say bad stuff about you, but right. they can't. Right, so I do think that's there. But for my mind, what uh, it, what I find most interesting is the way in which, and I think Marty Walsh is a great example of this. Those Irish and Italian ethnics who had abhorrent, repugnant experiences here at, in Boston, especially, right? They are now insiders, right, right? and. They have a hard time, and these are gross generalizations, but on average, they have a real hard time being understood as the power elite because, you know, they're fighting against the Brahmin and all those things. And but now they've been here several generations, many. Right. So I think having those two groups transition to insider status in the political parties or, or, or sorry, in the Democratic Party is a really interesting transition that's happened in Massachusetts politics. And they don't like being called insiders. Like who are these new groups who are more aggrieved than us? But what about our history? Well, but you got a couple generations now. So that's something I see going on. And I think Marty's a really good example of this, that. This is part of the Massachusetts exceptionalism. I shouldn't say shtick, but the, this, <laughs> this idea of it's sort of tribalistic, but it's also, um, if you're willing to play ball, if you're willing to play by the rules, 
that are maintained by the gatekeepers, right? You can earn your way after long effort into insider status, but you can't demand it. You have to start at the bottom. And it's, it's frankly very much part and parcel of much of the mythological notion of, uh, of sort of the American worth et work ethic, which is un, you know, clearly bound up in American exceptionalism, right? And so, but in Massachusetts, arguably, this is a laboratory where a lot more people believe it. And it actually exerts more actual influence on power. Right? That we have made clear that this is not a state where left where the left and the right are battling it out. That's happening almost everywhere else. But here it's a situation where the, the people who believe in sort of incremental, you know, sort of um, uh, meritocratic and that's a horrible way to use that term politics, they really still have a hold sway. They hold sway at the state house. They hold sway where it really counts. And so when you read, when, if you, you know, to, to write this book, of course, I went back and reread all the great, you know, the rascal king, all, all the curly, all the bulger, all the, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a clubby and tribal place. The pictures on our, on the cover, fantastic. By the way, uh, uh, my colleague is the one who wrote the political culture chapter. It's the best one in the book. <laughs> it's fantastic. And it really speaks to the degree that we have a really insular political culture. And we're not even trying to hide it. The jokes at the St. Patrick's Day breakfast, you see pictures of it, right? They don't, they are openly, they joke about corruption. They joke about total control of the state house. If you read Billy Bulger's uh, uh, memoir, which is in such a fantastic Massachusetts way, has no index. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Because Billy doesn't want all the insiders just looking up where they were mentioned and reading only that part. <laughs> That's so Massachusetts politics. But the point is that very clubby, very uh, insular, and, and, and you can feel it when you go to New Hampshire because you're really experiencing mm -hmm. a different culture. I will very briefly, very, very briefly, I'll say my name's Erin O'Brien. And when I moved here, I lived in the back bay and then I was in Saudi and they were like, oh, you're back. I'm like, I was never from here. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I was just getting open arms that I was like, I don't think we're on the same, but Erin O'Brien opened doors still. Sorry. So uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Duquette and Professor O'Brien for a great uh, presentation and, and talk. Um, and I wanted to let people know that if you have other questions and you're in the audience, we have books for sale in the lobby, and I'm sure that they would be happy to answer additional questions. If you're joining us online uh, and we didn't get to your question, we'll pass them on so that uh, they have a chance to see them. And if anybody online are here, um, we're terrible at sales. It, we're doing really good in sales, but we're not hucksters. Um, there is a code. It's MAS049 that you can get 30% off. So for people online, I want to save you money. I am frugal by nature, <laughs> but you guys should all buy a book there. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs>